Welcome to Grit with Wisdom. This is the podcast that delves deep into the inner psyche of mountain bikers from all aspects of our sport in order to discover the tools and the tactics that can help us have more fun out on the trails more often. Our aim here is to help you understand what it takes to push our own personal boundaries in the sport we love from a mental and emotional perspective. Today on the show, I'm sitting down with my friend and fellow coach, Piyush Chavan. Piyush hails from India and grew up as part of a core group of just a handful of riders there before cutting his teeth in downhill races in the neighboring mountain playground that is Nepal. He was later inspired to move to New Zealand and live a biking lifestyle after meeting a Kiwi while riding and racing over in Bali. He went on to study a tourism business management degree at QRC and then opened his own coaching business in 2021, which has since served hundreds of clients in the Queenstown and surrounding areas. Super excited to be sitting down with Piyush today because along with being an absolute weapon on the bike, he's also a man with substantial depth and has spent a significant amount of time off the bike, learning about himself through meditation retreats, yoga, mindfulness practices that he also incorporates in his riding and coaching practices today. Man, no further ado, welcome to the show. Thanks, mate, and thanks for the amazing intro. It's been great. How was that? Did I miss anything there? Uh, no, I think you covered everything, and I was quite <laughs> impressed how, how you, well you described all of it. Yeah, yeah, sounds like you've been listening well to all the conversations we've been having, so that's good. Fantastic. Yeah, man, like we were saying, we've had so many good chats already, kind of driving around in the van, doing the coaching together. Super excited to sit down and record some of that wisdom here today. Yeah. I think it would be really cool to, to start off right back at the start. Like, cool. you grew up in India. What was that like? And when did bikes first come into your life? Well, growing up in India was um, pretty normal for the first half, I'd say. Um, basic schooling and everything. Um, there was quite a bit of, like, Hindu philosophy involved, like growing up through school, there's quite a bit of that um, put in um, through school and everything that where we do yoga first thing in the morning and whatnot and lot, lots of meditation throughout throughout our curriculum and all of that stuff. Um, as soon as, so to turn it back a little bit on how I exactly got into biking in India is uh, I think it's because of my mom because she is quite a bit of a daredevil herself and she's been, she used to do a bit of off-road. So she would always encourage me to do some adventurous stuff and take me out trekking and all of that. And um, initially, I got into skateboarding after playing uh, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 on PlayStation. Oh, that's and so I was good. Like, oh, skateboarding sounds good because that sort of matched the kind of adventure I wanted out of a sport. And I got into skateboarding. Dad, we didn't really have any skate parks. And uh, there was this one time I was on the other side of the street with a friend, and uh, there was a group of bikers on on the opposite side coming to us and one of them asked me if I could jump on that skateboard and I was a shy 11 year old so I didn't really say anything and shook it off but um, that guy is um, one of my best friends now and uh, th those group of bikers were one of the core mountain bike community uh, mountain biking groups in uh, in the city and um, later on I started like exploring on my bike and I ended up meeting them and riding with them wow. and found out that oh there's like, there's like these five or ten guys that ride mountain bikes in this entire city and later we found out that they're, they are only one of the two or three groups in the entire country as well that were riding bikes by then. So it was a bit of like a meant to happen sort of thing of how I got into mountain biking. And then from then on, it was, it was just a cycle of me riding my bike, you know, trying to sometimes bunk school and head out in the hills and just ride trails by myself and whatnot. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's such a cool backstory. It yeah. fascinates me, like we were having this conversation in the van the other day and I was amazed because I'm like, wow, there was only like 10 people in your village, but uh, like 30 people in the whole country that were riding bikes and somehow yeah, you cool. managed to be one of them. That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. Like the city, the city that I come from currently has about 7 million people and um, we still have, I would say, maybe like 100 core oh. mountain bikers and maybe I'm overestimating the number and it's just, uh, we still don't have like a proper mountain bike trail network to go but we have lots of um, pirate trails and tracks and stuff that we're riding on. Yeah, and you mentioned yeah. you kind of grew up watching lots of mountain biking movies coming out of places like the States and Canada. Yeah, that's it, right? Like and you guys uh, were kind of building your own free ride trails and mimicking course. what they were doing that. Totally, totally, yeah. We didn't, we didn't build any of the good, you know, manicured landings that we saw uh, in the videos because it was too hot to build. Right. So we pretty much just found a cliff and sort of cleared some rocks and off we went, that sort of thing. But, uh, 
yeah, it was a fun time. That's fantastic. Um, and how did you go about getting parts, getting bikes in a place where no one was riding and there wasn't bike shops? It was, it was very interesting. Like even the perspective of being in India and spending more than just $300 on a bicycle was a very wild concept. It has changed a lot now because um, the country has progressed in different ways and like outdoor sports are far more important now. But then when I told my parents that I want a bike that costs like $300, they were like, what, what's, what's this? And uh, when I did end up getting that bike, every time, every month I'd break a derailleur because I'd do a drop and like, you know, snap the derailleur in half or something like that. And like some of the boards would bend and everything. And it was a Firefox. You know, not uh, nothing, nothing yeah, crazy. Yeah. Basically, like a Walmart bike. Yeah, yeah. But I was like so stoked to have it. That's so cool. You got the job done. Yeah, yeah but um, we'd wait like weeks and weeks just to get those parts to come through and like keep riding, keep riding. And uh, over time, we ended up getting newer bikes. So a couple of my friends would travel out to the states and everything. And um, when they'd come back, they'd get in some secondhand bikes. So we had these like really old classic downhill bikes. Uh, my first one was a Fos DHS Mono 1 nice. and I was 35 kilos when I bought it and the bike was 25 kilos. <laughs> oh, wow. So that was a bit of an experience riding it. Um, but yeah, it was cool. It had those um, older Hope disc brakes. You know with the labors where they still have that massive oil cylinder yeah, yeah. on the top? So yeah, that old. That's sick. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that was my first bike and uh, we just sort of kept going from there. And we'd look out for Chain Reaction Cycles and Jensen's USA for all the deals and if anything was 50% off we'd order it because then by the time it reached India with the custom duty which was so high it would be the same price. Right yeah so there was no deals in India it was getting a deal Nothing. just so you could pay regular price. Totally totally yeah. yeah so we'd keep watching out for those sort of deals and then, and then bring them down. I love this story it really speaks to your passion because it sounds like that was it was no easy feat to keep mountain biking you were breaking stuff every week it was hard to get parts it was expensive. Totally. totally. You kept at it. Yeah, but I don't think it was more of like a, yeah, the, like the grit came in later, but um, the sport was just so novel and um, the the city that I lived in was covered in hills and everything and the wildlife and all the forests and stuff and riding your bike in the forest. There's nothing, nothing can, that can replace it really. Oh. So, you know, if you're into, if you're more of a person that likes the solitude a little bit more, it's, it's it can be quite... Um, Novelty inspiring? I didn't want to say addicting because that's a funny word, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I know where you're going with that. It's, yeah, it's yeah. kind of like once you start mountain biking, it's very hard to stop. Totally, man. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Fantastic. So walk us through going from there, kind of growing up in that core group of riders. You then got into racing from there. Tell us that story. How did that come about? Yeah, because um, I think there was a bit of an ambitious side to riding bikes because you always want to be progressing, progressing, and at some point you want to test yourself against, against some riders as well. So um, I think the core group of people that we were, they were pretty clued on to um, organizing events and whatnot because of, you know, from their jobs and all that, they had those skills. So they would go out and organize their own um, racing events. Um, funnily, because the biking scene back home was so small, like it was, even in the general cycling scene, it was like pretty mixed up. So all the cross-country riders were all the road cyclists and the road cyclists were all the downhill riders and all of that. So it wasn't really like, oh, you're a road cyclist, you're a cross-country, you're a downhill. The bicycle was the same for everyone. Right, so you ride bikes. Yeah, that's it. And uh, we had these series called the Bangalore Bicycle Championships, which is, um, which is just a city in the south. And they still organize like really epic local races. And it me mostly into um, road cycling and these BRM style races. But they decided, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll do some downhill racing too. And started organizing downhill races every year and that sort of like ticked off the sort of momentum to keep organizing more and more races and uh, we started going to those and compete against each other and everything and uh, sort enough like we had three or four races in the year which was just downhill and cross country and that was pretty cool nice. and that's how we got in but the funny thing is that we still did not have the kind of tracks to practice on um, and I had this ambition to uh, race internationally and race World Cups and stuff at some point to really get the name on the map that, mm. hey, there's races in India. So um, I'd go out to Asia and spend like two or three months racing and then go out to Europe, spend two or three months racing. And then when I'd come back to train, the best I could do was go to the gym and go for like longer rides and, you know, ride some of my older tracks. But those tracks weren't nearly the standard of what I was racing, even in Asia, because um, you know, the community in Asia is pretty big. Like when I was in Indonesia for two months, they had 300 riders show up to a race, wow. 60 of them women. Wow. And you wouldn't That's think awesome. of that from Indonesia, right? Yeah. 
But um, I felt like if a country which is similar in terms of, you know, its economy and everything with India can do that, sport can certainly grow big in India as well. And um, I was just waiting, waiting, waiting for that to happen. But it's just sort of still in that little phase where it's deciding what to do. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's it. Fantastic. So then from there, you're traveling around in Asia. You spent some time in Indonesia racing. Yeah, yeah. You heard about New Zealand. Totally. Um, about there. Let's fill in the gaps. Yeah, I was sort of like racing so much and spending so much of money. And I still had a sponsorship back then that was uh, providing me bikes and everything on a borrowed basis. So I would still be able to like not spend on the bikes, but then spend on the travel and go on as many races as possible. And this one year, 2017, I think, uh, I did about 12 international races in that whole year while studying. So that was quite hectic, including like, you know, representing the country for the Asian championships and whatnot. Um, but I felt that, hey, where I'm coming from did not really do justice. And I was thinking, oh, maybe I should move somewhere. Um, so towards the end of my Indonesian trip, I was like, oh, I've got to make a decision this year of what I want to do. And I met this uh, Kiwi lad, James, and he just told me that, hey, I think uh, I was telling him, oh, I probably should go to Australia to um, maybe study at this uni. They've got some bike parks there. And he's like, no, 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 you got to go to Queenstown. And I hadn't even heard about Queenstown. Um, I just knew Rotorua in New Zealand. Like, okay. I wouldn't even think of New Zealand as like a place I needed to go. Yeah. And uh, that same day, he's like, oh, I'll just come over for dinner and uh, we'll chat about it. I was like, oh, I just met this guy. He seems pretty keen. Yeah. And I uh, went over and we just chatted for like three hours. He gave me the whole full rundown about how my life would look in Queenstown. Wow. Including where I would be working, where I could study and all of that stuff. And I was like, okay, cool, man. I think uh, this is pretty good. He's made the decision for me. <laughs> and then six months later, I just moved here. Uh, decided to study at Queenstown Resort College because that's the only way for us to like get a visa and everything to like stay longer term. And then figured like the adventure tourism course is pretty good. Um, that sort of in lines, aligns with what I want to do. Um, and funny thing is I had a friend back home who uh, has been to New Zealand for studying and he had just returned. And I told him that, hey, I met this guy and I want to go study at QRC and do this. He's like, bro, I did the same exact course. Oh, wow. There yeah. You go. So I was thinking, oh, there's a sign. I should just go. Yeah. And um, yeah, six months later, I was here. It's fantastic. So you didn't mess around in kind of thinking about it at all. It no, fun. because like, I didn't think they had too many options to begin with. And I feel like the way he described Queenstown was pretty appropriate to the experience I've had in the last five and a half years. So yeah, wow. yeah that was good. It's super cool to hear that he was so passionate about it. <laughs> to like, totally, man. Invite totally. you over for dinner, give you the full rundown, and then here you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, that was a that was a good one for sure. <laughs> Fantastic, man. I want to get into talking about some mental tools here because I know you've got a, a depth of experience there. Maybe we can start by talking about some of the mindfulness practices uh, that you learned through growing up in India, and then how that's now uh, come around to help you when you're riding the bike. Well, the thing about um, growing up was that it was just a very normal thing for us to um, start our day with um, doing Surya Namaskar which is sun salutations and everything and then start with a bit of chanting and whatnot which I found absolutely unnecessary as growing up you know as a teenager you're pretty rebellious right like you yeah. wouldn't understand the reason of why these things are there so the teachers were having you do yeah, yeah. like everyone like all the 200 kids or 300 kids in school would just come in do that thing for the first thing in the morning and then start the day and i didn't notice the difference then but now when i ingrain that same practice in, i can understand how my day goes because i'm a lot more composed and whatnot and I think um, that's where that stems from so I'm starting to slowly go back to my roots and understand that all oh, what we did through school and there's a reason why traditions like these exist and all of that stuff and I'm linking back to my older roots to find a bit more of uh, balance in my in my current life yeah because things do get hectic like everyone who's lived in Queenstown can know how overstimulating it can be and oh, yeah. uh, just to find that balance um, I'm happy to have a little bit of that mindfulness and meditation background yeah, which I can it. tap into. I find it fascinating because it's pretty much opposite to what we get taught in Western schools and what I get taught in Australia. There's, there's none of that. Uh, but I can totally relate on a sense of, you know, quite a lot of the good things we did learn in school, I despised at the time, I didn't want to do. Yeah, and exactly. And then as you yeah. become an adult, you're like, oh, perhaps there was some wisdom in that. Perhaps that is a good idea. 100%. And like, we think of schools as like unnecessary and all of that stuff when we're teenagers, right? But um, I feel like they shape us, shape our thinking, like they give us a framework to think. And that's pretty important. Yeah, and perhaps we don't think, don't think we're learning much at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when we're an adult, we can look back to that and be totally. like, okay, at least that's given me a basis to build upon. From totally. Here. 
So really cool to hear. So these days you're starting your day with some yoga, with some mindfulness? Yeah, mainly with uh, just a meditation technique called Vipassana. Um, I just went on a um, 10 day course in August. And that, that basically is like a, it's, it's a technique that's been passed down since the fifth century. And they just, like you spend 10 days in silence, observing your breath and then observing your sensations. And, you know, just come to an understanding that all things in life are like quite impermanent because you experience the impermanence in your own body. And then it makes sense to, it's basically training your mind to be aware and equanimous with every experience that you have. And it sort of uh, recreates the habit pattern of your mind to move towards either craving or aversion and takes it away and makes you more of an observer where you can stay still and choose to do certain things and respond as opposed to reacting. So wow. yeah, that's been... It's so interesting. You talk about that like it was an easy feat, like, oh, I just did 10 days in silence. But for me, it's, yeah. it's amazing. I struggled to go yeah. 10 minutes or 10 seconds without talking. And that's the funny thing, right? Like we think that, oh, we can't go 10 minutes or whatever without talking because everything that comes up in the head eventually passes and goes away. And that's the whole thing about Vipassana, that it just helps you understand that everything that comes, it's always coming and going, coming and going at the greatest velocity so there's no point of us attaching to our thoughts or emotions in that way we can always be an observer of it and respond if we want to if we find it appropriate and that's basically just training the mind to do that that's fantastic yeah and yeah you talked a lot when we were chatting about this the other day about during that process during that week you became more and more in tune with the energy in your body yeah and some different awareness there can you speak on that yeah i think i think every time with people who, I, who have done Vipassana, um, they can relate really well when I say this, that every time I talk about the experience, I feel like I just don't do any justice to it because it's very hard to intellectualize something that you sense on a very deep level. Mm. Um, throughout the meditation, like the, the mind just becomes so aware of all the sensations in the body that you realize that, oh, the body is filled with sensations. And it's constantly like pulsating, beating, um, riveting, and like there's electric currents and like heat and cold and all of those things are constantly happening. And they're, they're, those sensations are basically a result of the triggers in the body because the mind over time has always reacted with craving or aversions. And every time it reacts with craving and aversion, it develops as a sensation on the body. So the idea of Vipassana is to just be aware of those sensations and not react to them so that those triggers can like rise to the surface and go away. Um, so to just like, I don't think I would do justice about talking about it in this podcast, but um, to describe the most profound experience I had was I think the last hour of the meditation on the 10th day where um, we were scanning our bodies and everything and I would always feel like this little tension in the back of my head when I was scanning it and I wouldn't understand what that tension was the whole time in the meditation. Um, but it turned out it was just my sinuses and as I was observing them they would just like crack open and you know how you um, if you're on a flight and you land your ear pops and everything. Yeah with the elevation. Yeah and my ears were popping and my nose was popping open and all that and after that my head was just super clear and I went out of the room and I realized everything that I'm looking at has the absolute clear clarity and I did not really have any jumpy thoughts or whatever and my head was just the feeling is as I was breathing in was just like a, yeah breathing in fresh air for the first time sort of thing yeah it's quite a it's quite an experience for sure that's amazing it's yeah it's certainly something you've inspired me to investigate a little further myself as well yeah 100% man helps everyone super cool so such a wealth of uh, experience there working on mindfulness working on yourself off the bike yeah Let's talk about mental practices on the bike now. Is there any particular mental tools, techniques or strategies that you've used over the years to help with your riding? I think um, uh, this is something that I use a little bit in my teaching as well. It is more to do with how the nervous system feels in general. So if, if I'm trying to push my limits, for, for example, and I'm in that spot where my body is just not wanting to do it, there's no point of my mind trying to like push through it and go for it. So I try, and, I try and be mindful of, again, the sensations in the body and just being tapped in the body and riding well first, well, where I'm pumping every corner well and all of that, and then decide that, okay, I think I'm pretty tapped into my, all my responses, and if I wanted to execute something, I can do it. And then I just try and intuitively commit to it rather than force myself. So that's how, that's how I've been um, 
taking a step away from like, you know, listening to some heavy metal music and being like, yeah, I just get stoked and send it. So I'm like, okay, how am I feeling today? Is this, is today the day to conquer what I'm about to conquer and all of that? And just working along those lines and being delicate with my decisions of uh, whether I want to do something or not, because yeah. um, I feel like staying on the bike and riding a trail is far more fun than, um, you know, just sending it and doing something crazy and then crashing. Totally, yeah. totally. Yeah, it's such a wise approach, kind of tuning into what the body's doing first and then making the decision. Totally, yeah. Do you ever have like a, an off day where you're like, oh, man, I'm just not really feeling it today? Yeah, I did. I do, and it's, that is um, for sure has to do with like how tired you feel sometimes, like when your mind is fragged too much from lack of sleep and like overdoing things. There's just time when your body's like, now. Nah, I just don't want to do it. And uh, yeah, there's there's no other way to deal with it than you know just go get some rest, come back another day, and totally. give it give it a crack. Yeah, speaking of sleep, I found it really interesting the other day. You were talking to me about your process for doing backflips and, and how it feels. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you tell tell us the difference between you know what you notice when you're doing a backflip after a night of good sleep when you're feeling sharp? Yeah. And what you've noticed when you're doing a backflip and you perhaps haven't had as much rest as you needed? Well, the biggest thing is that. Um, when I would try and flip with, that, with no sleep or like a bad night's sleep is that I just don't see my rotation whatsoever. I'm just pulling and then suddenly the landing's there and I'm landing it. So there's not a lot of awareness going on, which is a bit weird. Um, that sounds spooky. Yeah, it does sound spooky. And then I'm like, okay, cool. Maybe today is not the day to be doing stuff like this. But um, if I've had like really good night's sleep, I can really prime my movements well. So I can pull the way I need to and... Um, feel the rotation completely. I can see the sky, then the brown landing and all of that stuff. And then, you know, respond to what's happening properly. And sleep does play a really good role in helping the nervous system regulate itself and be in a place where you can respond as opposed to just like constantly react from instinct. I see. Yeah, and that's what, that's what I try to do as well. If there's like certain mistakes that I'm making, I try and calm myself down first because I'm fighting an instinct. The instinct is there to keep me safe, right? There's no arguing with an instinct unless you already feel safe. So I'm trying to feel myself, uh, try to make myself feel a bit safer inside the head and in the body and calm myself down before attempting to change a certain technique or like do something that's scarier. Yeah, that's a great way of doing it. And what are some ways that you will try and calm yourself down if you are feeling a little bit heightened? Um, belly breathing for sure. Belly breathing and firstly, like do like doing a few big body scans and just feeling into how the body's feeling, whether there's like some muscles that are, you know, feeling tired or not and all of that. And then trying to find um, how the sensation, whether it's like hot and cold, and then from going from there then to visualization, as opposed to visualizing straight away, because sometimes I've found that visualizing straight away can make me feel more anxious. So I try and calm myself down and then visualize things and then it helps. Right, yeah, so if you visualize things from a place where you're feeling anxious or fearful, yeah. This perhaps makes you feel more fearful, right? Yeah, Especially if you're trying to do a backflip or something totally, that's hard for you. Totally spiraled it down and everything, so I have to like really chill out. Right, so it down. sounds like there's a bit of an order to your process. It's like yeah. body scan first. Yeah. And um, I don't think like this is something new. I feel like most of most pro athletes would do do this in a certain certain way. Because um, the first first time I started doing it was after listening to Aaron Gwynn, that he always takes a nap before his race runs. Right. And like he, he was in his winning streak then and he was like winning pretty much every race as you're entering, right? I was like, oh, he does take a nap out before his run. And I started doing that and it made such a difference just to my general riding and the feel of riding the bike and everything. So you'd be having a nap in the car before your race run, that kind of thing? Yeah, race yeah. run or just a ride, just like, you know, tap out for a bit and then and then get, get into it. Yeah, I just kind of relax a little bit first. Yeah. Totally yeah. makes sense. Yeah, That's it. Fantastic, mate. I, lo I love where we're going with this. And I wanted to talk here a little bit about if you're on the trail and you're perhaps pushing your limits, running some stuff that's technical or hard for you, or you're going faster than usual. What do you do when you come up with like fear, doubt, hesitation, emotions like this? Yeah, it is a, it is a bit of a hard one to um, push past that. I feel like, again, I just have to go about observing them and not really respond to them, but being very aware that they're there and just start, try and work with them. There's no, like, it's, you know, it's like arguing with a person that's angry already. You can't really do that. You have to sort of give them the space and, really, you know, let them express the full spectrum of emotion that they want to express and then find a window to go in. And that's the same thing with your own emotions. Like, if they're coming up, there's no point saying that, oh, no, I'm feeling this, but I have to do this. 
it's important to let them come up. It's important to like let them have their day. And if there's frustration, hesitation, it's there for a reason. You know, it's only gonna it does like it's only gonna build you up from there on and um, broaden your scope of how to manage them in other different situations. So it just yeah, letting them have the day and just being equanimous with what's coming and not trying to like oh. I want this to happen this way or that to happen that way. That's when things start to go funny. Totally, yeah, I'm sure we've all kind of experienced that before where we ignore that fear or we try and put it at the back of our brain yeah. and push through it. Totally. Yeah, totally. it's a fantastic way of putting it. Yeah, so. but then like I also don't think that it's, um, you know, you shouldn't have goals. Like it's important to um, have a certain goal, but at the same time, not be intensely moving towards it because there's other things that can help you along the way like you know dealing with tough emotions and whatnot that are still helping you towards the goal but you may not realize it at that point right so kind of like tasks that will help you get there or yeah. little steps rather than yeah totally yeah how will you go about like say if you've got a really big goal it might be like your two-year goal or your five-year goal on the black or your one-day goal how will you go about breaking that down into small steps um, that's that's something I do I do sometimes struggle with because uh, I feel like I'm, I'm a bit of a big picture guy where I'm like okay this is the big picture and I try and go about it and paint it but sometimes I miss out on the details so it's something that I'm still working on I still try and reaffirm the big picture in my mind and just try and steer towards that and whatever's coming I deal with it then so I do not really have a structured plan I'm afraid but uh, so you've got almost like you know where you're headed, yeah. you know your destination, and then yeah. you'll kind of live in the present from there and totally, deal totally. with whichever little challenges come up along the way. Exactly, yeah, and like, you know, like any sort of progression in biking as well, we always, we see our students doing it, like we always spiral upwards, like we think we've got a certain skill and it starts to hit, hit the top and you go back and then you again go up. And I feel like that's just the same thing with reaching your goals as well. You're always going to spiral upwards and as okay. long as your eyes are on that and you're staying steady in your progression, it's, it works out. Yeah, I love that spiral analogy. It's one I've heard from someone else as well, rather than it being like a circle, like we're going around in circles having the same problem. Yeah. It's that upward spiral, and although we might still have challenges and totally. problems, totally. we're still making progress. To totally, yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. Fantastic. And I'm curious, like, what's a, what's a new skill that you've worked, learned lately? How did you go about uh, it? In, uh, in terms of just like biking? Yeah, in terms of biking, it could be a trick, it could be a particular move on the trail. Uh, being proactive on the bike. Uh, I've realized that I could uh, bunny hop into things and like stay a little bit more in my default position where I'm quite stubborn in my um, torso and quite engaged in my torso, but my arms and legs are just fluid and they're moving it out. So I feel like that, I've tried to like bring that into my riding and that's been working. Fantastic. And I try and, I try, I just try and keep finding these little gaps where if there's like a dip I see, I try and pre-hop it and stuff like that just to keep my speed going. Yeah, and I can certainly see that in your riding. We just did a, a fantastic run at Skyline Bike yeah, Park yeah. here in Queenstown down Squid Run. Totally. And that I got so many ideas for gaps just from following your lines. Oh, it was really cool to see yeah. a really playful ride in. Yeah, that, that, that I find is rewarding, just getting your wheels off the ground at every opportunity is, uh, has been a, it's been a good experience. Totally, and it's a great way of making trails that may be perhaps like easy for you without getting super playful. It's a great way of making them really Totally, fun, right? right? Like some of the routes and stuff you just don't want to ride down, and if you can find a line that you can just gap over and land, land in a sweet spot, then it does make sense. Definitely, yeah. yeah. It's amazing how many different ways you can ride the trails once you kind of add some bunny hops and some jumps into your bag of skills. So yeah, totally. That kind of leads into a question I wanted to ask. When it comes to your riding and your coaching, which we'll get into in a second, you talk a lot about the idea of body dynamics, mm -hmm. body awareness. I'd love to hear you speak on that and what that means for you. Well, and in terms of my thing, like I said, I um, sort of make sure there's like, if there's engagement, it has to be in the right spot. So I try and keep my core engaged for the most bit so that my arms and legs are free to move and if you know like if you notice any of the videos of pro riders for for example um Vinny T when you see him riding yeah like his torso and head are just like straight you know he's aiming at something but his body underneath is just having a dance having a party and uh I think that's pretty cool and yeah I've, I've tried to uh, ingrain that into my own riding so every time I feel stiff I realize that oh if I'm feeling stiff in my arms and legs there's something not quite right if there's engagement that needs to be there in the body it needs to be in the core where it, like the core tries to stubbornly stay central and the body is just like moving underneath to help it stay central yeah and that's, um, that's what translates into how how we coach as well because like every single skill that that we're coaching too doesn't matter if it's cornering jumping um, just regular pressure control if you're not central it's all gonna go out the go out of the window 
Yeah. You know, none of that's going to work. So it all boils down to, hey, staying in the center of the bike. And um, every single technique is just to like coming back to that circle. Stay in the center, stay in the center. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. The foundation of all foundations, eh? Totally, totally. You yeah. always say this yeah. coaching, don't we? We can't stack anything else cool on top. Exactly, yeah. That's have got that foundation. So. 100%. And those foundations is where most of the maximal gains are, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, there's the, the biggest gains are to be had at the bottom of that skill pyramid, totally, aren't they? Totally. Hello everyone and thanks for listening. If you're enjoying the podcast, don't forget to give it a like, give it a subscribe. And if you'd like to know more about my journey in mountain biking and my background as a mountain bike coach, check out episode number 29 where I dive a little bit deeper into that. Now let's get right back to the podcast. So yeah, tell us the story about creating Treadmark and becoming a coach. Yeah, um, well, back home initially, this, this starts back home actually, because um, I started this uh, company called Indian Shredder, because the term Indian Shredder meant an Indian mountain biker, which is a very rare thing. And I was like, all right, we've got to be a little rebellious here and, um, and put this out so everyone um, who's ride bikes can just hashtag it on Instagram, hashtag Indian Shredder, Indian Shredder everywhere. Awesome. And we started organizing some camps and races. We had like this weekend camp where um, we go to a resort and they let us build some tracks there and all that. So we do these educational camps of, you know, telling people what sort of positions to use and how to use their brakes on like regular mountain bikes. And it started from there on. And um, when I moved to New Zealand, my main aim was racing. But I came here with quite a bit of like student loan debt and everything mm. um, and that was quite expensive and I was thinking if I was racing that wouldn't be the best thing financially in the long term long long term process and then I was thinking oh, what else am I really good at and it was describing and articulating skills um, and I had this opportunity in my um, in my college to do a business for an assignment and they said that, hey, you want to start an adventure tourism business? These are the steps. You've got to create a safety management plan. You've got to create booking systems. You've got to create business strategy, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I just started working on it. I was like, okay, cool. What's, the, what's something that comes with mountain biking? I was like, oh, tread bike. Um, that relates to mountain biking. So just for fun, I created it. And um, over time, that fun became too serious. Right. where I went super deep into what exactly I wanted to do with it. And um, yeah, it just went deeper and deeper from there. Um, after graduating, we hit COVID, so the tourism in town just completely died. And I was thinking to myself, Farah, I just did a degree in adventure tourism and the tourism's dead. I don't really know what's going to happen. Um, because that time was so uncertain, right? COVID and everything, yeah. that's something none of us have ever experienced before. But as you we were coming out of it, I figured like, you know, screw it. We'll just, uh, we'll just see how this goes. And then in September, I just registered um, the business as, uh, as a sole trader because I was still on an open work student visa. So I technically wasn't a New Zealand resident and I could not register it as a company. Oh, wow. But then I asked the citizens at Vice Bureau and they're like, oh no, but you can do it as a sole trader. So I was like, oh, and it's the same thing as a company in New Zealand. Cool. And uh, so I registered as that. And then Feb on, I, was, I, was, I had completed like my safety management plans, got audited and all of that stuff. And it was all coming together and then just became started the experiment of seeing how those coaching clinics are working and it's been two years since we've been running and we've coached over about 350 clients really? most of them have been kids but i would say 30 percent have been adults um mostly women who've, who've uh, who we've seen globally as well have come up in the sport quite a lot and there's quite a bit of progression happening in that sphere definitely so yeah i feel like i got in at the right time Dude, it, yeah, you definitely did. I yeah. think you've really uh, filled a, a good niche here in Queenstown. There's a great demand for, for sure. skills coaching. Uh, and, the, you know, there's a few other businesses, but mainly focused on the, the tourism side of things and the guided tours rather than totally. the skills coaching. Totally. So, yeah, it's such a, a cool story of yours. I love this idea of to trademark this now successful coaching business uh, that employs yeah. multiple people here in town. Started as a school project, that it was just yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's crazy how things go along, right? Like um, I always figured, like I would run my own business at some point okay. because um, yeah, I, I just like the novelty of things and not not don't like having a steady schedule. So yeah, I just went along the flow really, and 
that's how it is. Do you feel like starting out without the pressure of like, will this business fail or will it make it and like going in like a real life sense? Do you think starting out as a project helped you just make moves and stay focused and get it done rather than get caught up worried about the little things? Sort of, yeah. Um, I did always imagine there's going to be like ups and downs with the business, but um, the way I went about it was quite step by step and I made sure that I wasn't like expanding too fast or too quickly in certain areas. Um, yeah, so it was, it was a very gradual process and um, even when we have quiet times and everything, it does, it does bog me a little bit like, oh wow, cool, this, is, this seems a little uncertain with how things are going, but then it always picks back up because you know, the service is always there. And as soon as the people come in, there's something to match that. So yeah, it's just, it just been like a little, um, it's, been, it's been an interesting journey, but um, yeah, the risk versus reward thing is, is yeah, it's good. It's, it's certainly very rewarding compared to the risk I'm taking for sure. Totally, yeah, and we can see that. We can see the passion in your voice when you're talking about this. It's so cool to see. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was gonna ask you there if you have anything that you'll tell yourself or any tactics you'll use when you do experience like a little bit of a stressful moment in your business, because I'm sure this relates to Black In as well. Yeah. Experience those same kind of ups and downs. Sometimes it's scary, sometimes it's really fun. Yeah, totally. And um, I think it's important to, again, go back to um, the learnings I had from the med you know, the professional meditation is that staying equanimous. It doesn't matter if it's um, going upwards or downwards. You've got to train the mind to stay steady and aware at the same time because when it's going upwards and you start craving towards it um, it can create a sense of like attachment and you're just like sort of wanting to do more and more and more of that because mm. like oh I had a busy season um, last month and I want to make the same thing happen but and you try and go towards those places to make it happen again but because you're so focused on that you might miss out on other sustainable opportunities right. elsewhere so for me, it's been a very good learning to see that, all right, we had a busy season, a busy, busy time last month. This month looks a bit different, but just being aware of, okay, cool. There is, there is a, bit of a bit of a dip in sales here, but there's also these other opportunities and avenues opening, which if I was just focusing on selling, you know, a certain course over and over again, that I would miss out on the other opportunities. So it's important to not react again to what's happening with the business and just keep that awareness of that, you know, um, peripheral awareness of what's happening so I can pick up on things that can help the business. Yeah, well, so that's what I've learned this year. And I think I'm just gonna stick to that and keep my eyes and ears open on what things, what things are doing and how trends are forming and all that stuff. Yeah, it definitely sounds like you're onto something there. Sorry, we must be sitting in a, a duck's playground here. He's not too happy with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, he's liking the conversation. That's what sure. I think I, maybe he's cheering you on. <laughs> So what I'm really hearing there is that you're yeah, not getting distracted by too much noise or perhaps by the cravings of wanting to, things to be different and instead holding yourself, staying present and seeing what opportunities there are now. For sure. And like, you know, um, if you notice in Queenstown, you, you might have seen this already because there's so many things happening in Queenstown. People want to do stuff. They're here to do stuff, which also means that it is also a bit of a last minute town. Yeah. So all the, all the other tourism operators, they've... They're, they're so um, veteran in this they, that, that they know that people are going to come at some point and that, that can be last minute. So they consistently stay ready for uh, what's to come. And uh, I'm trying to develop that. It's hard. But yeah, I'm like being that. at peace with that, knowing that you might not have income until the Monday before the Tuesday. Yeah, 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 you know. totally. So that's been that's been a little interesting. But um, yeah, yeah, right. It's, it's a learning process, right? No, it's, it's really cool, dude, seeing what you do. And I'm, I'm curious, you're out there coaching, you said over like 350 riders, children and adults. What's one of the most common things that you find yourself teaching out there over and over? Over and over, body dynamics. Body dynamics. They're like, oh, I want to learn how to jump. I want to learn how to corner. But um, most of my clients are like, they either, as soon as they reach anything steep or scary, they move away from the bike. Because as soon as you, know, you feel scared of something, you will move away from it. And once you do, you're still holding onto your handlebars, but your weight's all the way at the back. Mm. And just up, just firstly teaching them to bring the weight towards the front and more central um, has been the key thing. And that's been the theme of most lessons. And once that's built in, that's when we go on either cornering or, or jump lessons. So they come in with a goal and be like, okay, cool. To re in order to reach that goal, we're gonna have to um, go back to this foundation here and then uh, move along that way. Totally. Yeah, that's really cool. It sounds like, yeah, putting those building blocks in between their goal and where they are now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really sure. like that. 
And then like mental skills wise, is there anything that you find yourself often like coaching riders through helping riders with? Um, just, just reminding them that yeah, they are going to spiral upwards and it will certain, certain techniques when they're learning, they will find them weird because they are fighting their muscle memory, especially with riders who have been riding for a while and they've developed certain techniques that keep them safe. And the body's like, no, this, you know, squatting on my rear wheel makes me feel safe. Um, standing up a little bit taller makes me feel like I'm going to go over the handlebars, but just helping them. Uh, tone the environment, like uh, uh, we try and like, you know, tone the terrain down and helping them understand that, oh, this is actually far more sustainable and safer and recreating that safety in a new experience for them in their new position is, is a bit of a challenge. So I wouldn't really say there's many mental skills that I add in. I just try and recreate their experience in a safer environment so that it trains their muscle memory to be a bit better and more efficient over time. Yeah, so training them to feel more comfortable yeah. uh, in that new body position or doing that new skill. Totally, totally. Yeah, I like yeah, that. That's... It's crazy when to think about it, isn't it? I find this often when we change something as little as like a client's foot pedal position or something like this. Yeah. It can feel really weird and all of a sudden everything's feeling off for them. When we think about it, if we've been riding for a couple of years, we've probably put our foot on the pedal 10 million times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So to go and retrain that, it's going to take repetition. 100%, 100%. And uh, yeah, it's just basically like, like with anything, if you've developed bad habits, when you relearn something, it is going to feel different and um, quite often awkward. But that's just the way it is. Yeah, definitely. And I, I really like what you said there about toning the terrain down while you're doing that process. Yeah. So I know yeah. for me, if I'm trying to think consciously about changing any of my technique while I'm riding, I can't do that if I'm riding something that's really challenging for me. Exactly. I'm just focused on performing, staying on the bike. Yeah. And that's that's when the um, fight or flight response comes in, right? Because uh, when you're riding certain terrain that's beyond your, or like slightly more challenging, your instincts are switched on. Mm. Once your instincts are switched on, it's you're in that reactive phase where you're not gonna learn anything. So it's it's important for me to bring my clients back to that responsive phase where we can teach stuff and they can respond to the new technique as opposed to just reaction, reaction all the time. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and I know, yeah, you're, you're lucky you see riders uh, with a whole breadth of different skill sets from like first day on a bike even to being riding for, for 10 years plus. Across the board there, in your opinion, like why should everyone come and get a mountain bike lesson? Because there's always a bit of improvement that you can make for sure. It doesn't matter if you're riding a double black trail or like, you know, what's, whatever, whatever you're riding, there's always a certain technique that's gonna help you ride it better. And there's always room for improvement. Um, this, is, this is why I find, like even with me, when I started, let's say, to give you my example of when I learned how to do a backflip, um, I was flipping initially I was doing my flips really well and I was taking feedback from some of my friends and they were like no these flips looks really good and your technique looks proper as soon as I had a couple of crashes I started pulling really hard off the ramp instinctively because I was so scared and uh, it took me two years to like really relearn that trick again because I did not want to crash uh, the, the same way that I had so even in situations like that when you've been riding for a while and you have a crash and you come back your body tries to keep you safe. And that does not necessarily mean uh, the body is gonna go into efficient positions that are gonna keep you safe. You might go into some positions that aren't great for your riding, and uh, which is why it's important to get a lesson just, to, just for a coach's eye to see that, hey, are you, are you staying central? Are you maximizing the traction out of your bike? Are you giving yourself enough chances to stay on your bike while you're riding it? And which is why you should get a mountain bike lesson because that outside insight, outside insight, <laughs> is uh, very important. Totally. Sometimes we feel like we're doing one thing, but when we see that outside perspective, whether it's a video or a trained eye watching you, it's like, yeah. not quite. It might look like something Totally. Else. It's like, you know, there's the kids when they uh, ask their friends to film their whips and they, they think they've done a really big whip and you check it in the video, it's like, oh, wow, it just looks like a little bar turn. You say the and, kids, uh, but I feel personally <laughs> victimized. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it happens to everyone, right? No, like, it does. Just... Quite often, I even think like, oh, my body position's on point, and then someone will film me, and I'm like, oh, not quite. There's something we can tweak there. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So, is that outside perspective is quite, um, quite essential in that instance? Yeah, I, I love that that outside perspective, but I think also knowing what to do with that perspective, so having the right feedback to go along with it. Totally. Other yeah. than otherwise, it's like, oh, this doesn't quite look right. What should we do about it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Really cool, man. For sure. Really cool. So you're out there teaching students all kinds of things. I always like to ask the question, is there anything you've ever learned from a student? Um, I've learned that the same approach doesn't work for everyone. 
there's uh, there's different people who learn differently, and um, it's important to first understand how the people are learning, and that usually happens in a couple of lessons. With private lessons, I think it happens quite quickly because you're spending a lot of time focused on them. And uh, yeah, lots of new students have taught me that that yes, I know what I need to get them. Like I have a have a picture of yeah, their body position needs to look like this. But the approach that I use to get them there has been different every single time. And with some people, it can be the same. With some people, it has to be changed according and, you know, sort of boutiqued according to uh, where they're at and how they're taking the information. Totally. Yeah, it's always fascinating, isn't it? Trying to yeah. figure out what our learning styles are in particular totally. situations. Totally. And then people we're coaching as well. Some people are visual. Some people really like to think about it. 100%. Some people yeah. perhaps, yeah, like watching you. Um, awesome. So I want to know, coaching kids versus coaching adults, what are some of the main differences you find? Um, definitely far more repetition with kids, um, which is great for business, I guess, because uh, like when we do term programs, uh, I've noticed over the, over the few years that we've done them now, it takes at least, at least three, I think three is a sweet number, three to four term programs um, for the kids to be at a point where they're really writing intuitively and writing with composure because that's what I'd aim for in any of my lessons. Um, that's mainly because the kids have a lot of energy, right? And they, do, they haven't developed too much of those analytical skills just yet as, as like an adult does and they just want to keep going, going, going. And um, so it's important to mix a bit of, mix a lot of writing with a bit of like, hey, um, do you know how it feels to, you know, point your point your hips to the sky and you feel like you're hovering over the front on the bike and sort of help them feel the technique as opposed to analyzing and analytically telling them. So sometimes we'll just spend like about 15 to 20 minutes doing, uh, you know, a static stand and helping them feel that body position or technique and uh, applying it on the trail. So I feel like they learn a bit more on an experiential level. Adults, on the other hand, there's quite a few questions, there's quite a few analyzing, especially if, you know, if some, some, you meet sometimes intel, intelligent clients mm. and they really like to think it through. And sometimes they can overthink it as well. So, yeah, just breaking the technique down heaps more and discussing, discussing, and then also finding opportunities to apply it to that experience. Right. And then when they make the, make the connection of the intellectualized aspect of the technique and the experience of the technique, that's when they make progress. And yeah, it's always like that, oh, we know what needs to happen. We just need to make, make it happen for this guy and then this yes. guy and the next. <laughs> yeah, and you touched on there kind of two aspects of your process for coaching a client, starting with the body dynamics, ending with composure. Can you walk us through the other steps you've got there? Yeah, because we have a bigger picture in the mind, like all the coaches and stuff um, know that, hey, the riders need to look composed when they're riding. And we know that uh, once they've learned the technique, we just need to make sure the technique is primed enough so that comes on fluidly and they look fluid on their bike and uh, yeah so I, I feel like it takes at least two or three term, after school term programs which is about 24 weeks of um, riding with us for for the kids to really be at a spot where their riding is intuitive and that's that's what the goal is so yeah it's been there um, with adults the progression obviously can be quite quick because you can go so much deeper into the technique, you can analyze so many things. And with adults, the process is to really connect the analytical, um, intellectualized aspect of the technique to the experience of the technique. And once that connection is made, the progression just keeps, keeps happening. So at every step, we try and do that, whether, whether it's just learning how to tip their bike in into the corners, as opposed to you know finding far more traction with you know twisting the hips or like doing a bit of pressure control and brake control through the corners, so yeah, it's just, it's just the same process that applies to all of those aspects as they're going along in their riding journey. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah really intuitive kind of step by step process you've laid out. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Like you can't really push someone to do something when uh, they're unable or like you know you can't introduce bike body separation if they're already shaky on the bike, and uh, it just. Yeah, you just got to stabilize their position first and then jump into that. For sure, one step at a time. And it's definitely, yeah, important to pay attention to the order of those steps. 100%, 100%. Yeah. I like that. I wanted to ask here yeah, if you've got any techniques or strategies or things you do to avoid fear after, say, a crash or a setback. I know it's a pretty common thing that people will come across in mountain biking. Yeah, that is definitely a funny one because confidence, as most athletes and most professionals have said, that it is it is a delicate thing and you have to maintain it. 
So best thing would be to first avoid the crash, totally. Yeah. Um, and then if you did have a crash, um, it depends on what kind of crash it is. Sometimes it can be a free crash where you just slip on a route or something and then hurt yourself. Yeah. And then it is just telling your brain that, hey, that has happened because maybe I was a bit more complacent and it took place and that is the odds of that happening again aren't really that high. Mm. Whereas opposed to when you crash by attempting something that you're scared of and you're actively conscious while doing it and then you have a crash, that can be more damaging to the psyche a little bit. So in, in that aspect, I feel, I feel changing the approach, going back to the foundation again and um, let's say you crash during a gap jump, just working on the jumping technique and making sure your body is intuitively doing every single thing in a safe and sustainable way and then approaching that. So it, it takes a bit of time and uh, yeah, it just like once the confidence takes a hit, just like taking it nice and easy, nice and easy to build it back up to a point where it feels natural, where you feel like you've already overcome that fear before you do it. And uh, that's, that's where I'm at really. Yeah, that's how I deal with it. Yeah, I love that. So really following that process until it's almost like not an issue anymore. 100%, right 100%, yeah, 100% yeah. for sure. Until the point where like, you know, I crashed a couple of times doing back ease to dirt. Uh, the first time I under rotated and like, you know, went straight on, straight on my face. That wasn't oh, great. Nice. The second time I over rotated, let go of the bike and did splits on the landing. Oh. So yeah, that was, that was really bad as well. So I'm um, just trying to find the middle ground has been quite intense. And yeah. uh, I just had to go back and do as many flips as possible and like really do them when I'm present on the bike. And that was back into the airbag rather than... To back the, into the yeah. airbag, back, on, back into the mulch and then decided, oh, I'm feeling the tinges of go time. I've done this heaps of times and uh, I just have to trust myself now that I've trust the process that I've processed that I've put myself through and let the body do its thing. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. And almost like giving yourself a bit of a pep talk or reminder at the end that like I've done the work, I deserve to be here. hundred percent, hundred percent. I think it like um, getting over fear becomes easier when you're more in tune with your body as well, mm. because most of those emotions are stored. So if your body's feeling ready, there's no chance why you won't be able to do it. So yeah, it's just uh, being aware really. Yeah, being aware and I think accepting where you're at as well. 100%, as opposed yeah. to like getting caught up with where you used to be or where you want to be. Just being like, this is where I'm at, this is what I need to do. Totally, yeah. Taking a step at a time, right? Yeah. That's, that's the way it is. We're going to start winding things down here. This has been a fantastic conversation. Cool, yeah. The question I always like to ask is, who do you look up to in the mountain biking world? Uh, the first thought that comes to my mind would be uh, Connor McFallon. Uh, he's, a, he's a local legend. Yeah. Uh, rides, he's super, super easy to uh, chat to and everything. And I found that he rides at such a high level, but he's always so composed. And every time he shows up for a ride, he has these like hour of power sort of sessions where he comes in, does his thing, does some gnarly tricks and then heads out. He knows his process really well. Right. Yeah, and yeah. like, you know, that's a sign of a guy that, you know, sort of knows what he's doing and etc. So I sort of look up to, um, look up to that where you come in, you do what you need to and then you know, you quit early. Yeah, it's almost like you don't keep pushing it. One yeah. more run, one more run. Yeah, and like, you know, riders similar similar to just uh, like him that are performing on a higher level, but they know when to stop and they understand that they're performing. There's always that sweet spot and uh, maybe like a little bit of a spectrum where you can perform at that higher level. Mm. And then you have to sort of be like, okay, cool, my energy's not there right now. Yeah. And uh, these tricks demand that level of attention, which I don't have. And right. it's important to be like, okay, cool. I need to call it, go yeah. home, get some rest, come back another day. And uh, I feel like people who have figured that balance, yeah. that's, that's, that's the most rewarding thing because you can still ride your bike every single day. You can do like gnarly stuff every single day, but avoid crashing because you are working within the speed spot of that attention spectrum. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, so yeah, so like realizing where you work best, under what conditions, and then performing within that. Totally. Uh, even every time when I ride my bike and it might look like it's loose or anything, but there's barely any instance where I feel like I'm scaring myself. I'm always in that very relaxed state that when I'm riding and I just want to maintain that. And it doesn't matter what I'm doing, I just want to maintain that state because that's the most rewarding state. Doing something scary and like having an adrenaline boost isn't what I'm looking for. Yeah. It is just, yeah, just yeah. staying in that state for as long as, long as I can really. I totally agree with that. Like, I don't ride my mountain bike to go and be, like, scared and for it to be terrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure, sometimes it's, it's 
fun to push the comfort zone just a little bit and progress. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. I ride it with that comfort zone like 98% of the time. 100%, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Like a little bit of a wake up here and there is good, obviously. But Definitely. All the time can be, whew. <laughs> bit hectic. For sure, mate. What does it give you the opportunity here? Have you got any partners, anyone helping you out in the mountain bike world? business-wise that you wanted to mention? Um, yeah, we've got um, Andres Bike Studio. He's a good he's a good friend of mine and uh, he's just started his own workshop. Super talented and really has a very steady process of, um, doesn't matter if he's doing servicing suspension or servicing bikes, he just really knows what he's doing and cracks onto the job and gets it done. And I always think like he goes over and above and beyond with what he does. So I'd like to mention him. And uh, the second is uh, Marin Bikes. They've been, they've been really good. right here. Yeah. And I'm pretty stoked to be with Marin uh, through the business as well because I feel most of the clients that come to us are in that sweet beginner to intermediate spot where they're just looking to get into biking. And Marin's pricing range has been very appropriate in terms of being beginner friendly. Mm. And I feel like there was, there was this like alignment of, hey, we've got so many beginners that come to us and now they've got these amazing bikes that they can purchase and still and these really quality bikes with quality components they can purchase at a decent price and still get out and ride. Yeah, they definitely represent a really good value for money, I think. Fully, and uh, yeah, that just that just came along, so I'm, I'm glad to be representing them right now. Really cool. Fantastic, man. And where can people find you, find Treadmark, and follow along with your adventures online? Yeah, well, on Instagram, we are Treadmark NZ, Treadmark New Zealand, and um, yeah, website just treadmark.co.nz, and that's basically it. We, we keep posting a lot of, we're very active on Instagram, really. Um, yeah, and you'll find all our courses and all our tips and tricks and whatnot there. Our favorite coaching spots in Queenstown would be Seven Mile, Coronet Peak, Cadrona Alpine Resort, and my personal favorite would be the Winyard Jump Park, because um, that's just the most exciting place, in my opinion. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Access to yeah, all kinds of wonderful coaching facilities. Totally, yeah. totally. Cannot believe that in the middle of summer, Queenstown has two lift access bike parks and, you know, um, a whole array of beach forest trails and alpine trails and jump tracks to ride with. So it's definitely a, definitely a blessing to be here. Yeah, great variety. And speaking of variety, we've talked about all kinds of things in this podcast. If you could give the listeners just one little thing to take away with them, what would it be? Take away with them? Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. This is a hard one because we spoke about so many things. But um, I think my mind comes back to uh, the mindfulness aspect. If there is a chance to bring in a bit of meditation and mindfulness, it has very good ripple effects on the riding. Um, before I even started meditating um, intensely, I would do yoga and the whole mind-body connection is definitely a thing. And the way it translates on the bike, I've seen major improvements in how I approach things on the bike. So yeah, either yoga or mindfulness, whatever floats your boat, but an element of that, it certainly helps. Fantastic, man. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Cheers, mate. Thanks for having me. This was great. First podcast. (laughs) What's up, guys? Just one more thing before you hit the trails. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe and don't be a stranger. I'd love to hear from you about any topics or any particular episodes that you enjoyed and even about any guests that you'd like to hear me have on the show in the future. You can find me on Instagram at the underscore mind underscore mountain this podcast mountain biking and mindset are all things that are very close to my heart so i feel super grateful to be able to share these conversations with you so much love to you all for taking the time to listen i'll see you next time